Hello, Scott. Hello, Jamie. Hey, Steve. Hey, Scott. Hello, everybody, and thanks for popping in. And today is October the 16th. October's halfway behind us. It's moving. The time is just compressing. Really fast. Slightly. Moving very fast. So welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Office Hours webinar with myself and Steve. Today is the 16th. And before we get into the good stuff, just want to take a brief moment here to make the lawyers happy and just want everybody to be aware of the fact that we are not investment advisors. We host these webinars strictly for educational purposes. So if you do need investment advice, please seek out a registered investment advisor or another licensed individual to help you out with that stuff. So once again, uh, everything we share with you here today, strictly for educational purposes. And of course, we've got another test drive coming up. So obviously, if you're already a subscriber, probably not the biggest interest to you. But for those of you out there that might be kicking the tires, this is the best way to get in here and test the technology. Five days of unlimited access that includes the artificial intelligence for a mere $8.88. So that's going to be kicking off next week. So if you're not a subscriber, best way to get in here and, and test all the software out. Now, of course, for the regular attendees, please bear with me. This is more geared for the newer people. I uh, just want to always like to take the opportunity here to let everyone know that not only do we have this bleeding edge technology software, one of its kind uh, with artificial intelligence, but we've also built uh, quite a robust community around that technology. Uh, it all kind of starts off with Barry's Trading Room, uh, which is hosted by Barry Anderson. Uh, he opens that room up uh, a good 30 minutes before the open, uh, and he's in there all day uh, highlighting his trading style along with the software. So it's a really great place to learn and be around active traders um, who've got a little bit of experience under the belt. And the nice thing about that trading room is it's free. You don't even have to necessarily be a Trade Idea subscriber to get in there and see what all the buzz is about. So if you have not been taking advantage of the trading room, sign up. It's free. Of course, today's office hours with myself and Steve. And as far as the one-hour weekly webinars go, we have those Monday through Thursday. Um, and of course, on Fridays, we round it out with a three-hour come one, come all, anything TI-related Friday support session. Uh, but during the week, we've got a nice variety, myself and Steve today. Steve takes the helm tomorrow for the trade of the week. We switch it up a little bit and bring Brad and Dan in on Wednesdays. Andy rounds everything out on Thursdays, and I ride shotgun with him. And then we put the cherry on top Friday. So lots of, lots of interesting webinars showcasing the technology, different techniques, different flavors. And of course, always like to point out the fact that People have been responding to the AI. That's why we do these polls every time, because we're collecting that data. We're seeing how our users respond to our new enhancements. Of course, the biggest enhancement that we've made over the past, coming up on two years now, has been the AI known as Holly. And you can see our subscriber growth taking off as soon as we put that new development into the production version. All right. so. In keeping with today's action, although we did technically pop all-time highs today, pretty lackluster as far as movement. And you know, I the market was sleeping for a large portion of the day, Steve, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. It was. Um, I'll, be, I'll be happy to go over a few things uh, when you're ready. We'll take a look at a market recap. Yeah, I think it's probably a good time. Let me pass it right. on over to you. Red Rover, Red Rover, send the screen and share. There it goes. Okay, let's go. Monitor number one. Great. So um, there's our S and P Y, <laughs> the spiders. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and we'll talk a little bit about this on why Holly may have had kind of a quiet day today, but this is a train has left the station type of setup here. I mean, there's just been no pullback, just a relentless slow grind higher, many days low volume. Today was kind of more traditional 
right in the pocket volume, normal volume for the S&P, the Qs, and, and whatnot. The Dow, uh, as well as the S&P, as you can see there, the Dow handily made a nice new high today. <clears throat> um, uh, the DIA is an ICTF to, uh, to show um, how the movement of the Dow looks. And again, I mean, overbought, overextended, you know, these are words that come to mind. Um, again, we're going to talk a little bit about how our AI was kind of shy and bashful to jump on at such a late stage with a lot of trades. Um, I think our AI is kind of waiting for a correction or a day or two of pullback where we can hit the reset button on a lot of these uh, specific single chart windows. Um, but using the ETFs here and the indexes as a proxy for what's going on out there, the train is just slowly leaving the station and those that uh, dare to want to jump on without uh, the fear of the music stopping for a couple days and a big pullback, well, more power to them. Um, the cues, we haven't looked at the cues yet, kind of messy, but still also breaking out all-time highs today in the cues. But the one funny little stalwart is the Russell 2000, the IWM that we've been talking about. And we've been talking about this narrow range for almost two weeks now. And as you can see, the blue lines pretty much indicate that that is a working alert. Our working price alerts are blue on the chart. When they get tickled or triggered, they turn green and they become uh, from working to triggered. So what we got here is a really, really super tight range in the IWM. I mean, I've not seen um, uh, a, a sector or I should say uh, an index ETF with that tight of a range after that long of a run. So the Russell 2000 is kind of curious. Um, could go either way. We tried today, kind of a topping tail. We got real close to the bottom end, but as you can see, I've basically bracketed the tight range of the Russell 2000 to maybe tr try and get an early look. Maybe tomorrow we fire to the downside and the Qs and the spiders and the diamonds all take notice. But, you know, again, yes, it was another new high in the markets today. But um, again, our, our AI didn't participate that much. There's just not much um, statistical probability to be jumping in uh, things that are just up you know, day after day after day. So we need a bit of a, a, of a release balance. The market needs a shower, I think, for lack of a better term. Just a little shower to wipe off the grime and maybe reset and give us a new higher low that we can build a new base camp off of because this uh, this slow creep higher is uh, it's not exactly easy to trade. Uh, but again, the IWM, I'm watching for possible tell, possible ideas for an early look. I don't know if it's going to break to the upside first or to the downside first, but I can tell you that's a pretty unusual looking chart from coming all the way down here, a nice long move and then hardly giving anything back in price, just going sideways. Typically that would suggest a continuation pattern, which would mean a breakout higher. But, you know, we shall see. This thing has had lots of fits and starts and uh, hasn't really broken out of either direction yet. So I'm watching the IWM for a possible tell. But in the meantime, S&P, Diamond, Dow, Qs, it's just uh, the train left the station a long time ago and continues to just slowly build on it with small gap ups like we had today. Come back, fill the gap, go down to new lows, and the buyers come back in and then rinse, repeat. That's kind of what we've been seeing a lot of lately. And honestly, I'm looking for something different here pretty soon because uh, this is, um, it's it's not easy uh, to be the guy to want to jump in on the 15th update in a row and uh, take some big positions. But that's what I'm seeing. Anything you want to add, uh, Jamie, feel free to jump in before I pass it back. Oh, no, just, I agree with what you said. It's like the market needs a shower. You know, the <laughs> analogy you like to use all the time, the, the, the troops, they've been battling, battling, battling. They're 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 tired they're hungry they're also dirty so yeah. you, you got to take a little pause before you can go higher um yeah. but to see That's... that activity in the iwm after so many failed attempts and then to see that big energy expenditure and then the little base camp starting up up there well who knows who knows i will say this um if we do see a breakout to the upside and it is it been it does become a continuation pattern start paying attention to the stuff on your screen and Holly that's under five or $10, you know, the small cap, the small weighted stuff, the uh, junk stocks as people call them. Um, if we get a nice concerted uh, breakout out of this IWM, again, I would not be surprised to see a lot of good setups start to come through the alerts on, um, on the AI and on uh, new high alerts and other scans that you might have specifically again, 
low cap stocks. That's what the IWM is tracking. It's tracking 2,000 of rather low cap stocks, the Russell 2000. Yes, exactly, David. Mighty Mouse is a strategy that you might see pop up occasionally on Holly, which is designed for stocks, I believe, under $5 or under $10. So um, regardless of what comes out, you know, keep an eye on this IWM for possible um, market, um, market um, tell in other words. And yes, to borrow from what uh, Jamie was saying, you know, that, uh, that is all from the art of war and trading, you know, giving the, the troops a nice hot shower, a nice hot bath, letting them have a nice sleep, rest up for the next day. That's typically why I say I like stocks that go sideways under a resistance level and then push forward. You know, stocks, whether this is a single stock or not, I'll just use this as an example. Here's the spiders taking nine or seven or eight green days to push up to this level. And then I had to take a little bit of a breath here. You know, you can't expect a stock to move or an index to move five, six, seven days in a row and then hit its major level of resistance and then just push through that like butter, like there was a turbocharger already just waiting for it. No, it takes a little time. You got to hit a resistance. We got to pull back a little bit. And then that's where the analogy comes in and the art of war. Or, you know, give the troops a warm meal, give them a shower, give them uh, a couple of games, whatnot, and then get the battering ram back in their arms and pull back and see if they can push it to, to higher levels. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, Jamie, we'll send Good it back stuff. to you. Good stuff. Let me uh, let me pull it back up over here, and you know, I don't know what's going on today. I guess I'm just cursed with any loud noise that can really? come by my house right now is is doing it. So <laughs> it's closed on my windows to try to uh, well, prevent all the noise pollution. All you but can I, do is make the disclosure, and you've done it. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it just happens to be a freakish day where we're supposed to get up to 90, 90 degrees on the coast today. So uh, hopefully I won't have a heat stroke during this webinar. Yeah, when you don't have air conditioning because you don't need it usually. Yeah, there's yeah, a couple of days well, out of the year where you kind of wish you had it. The you know the weather gods are just giving us a little punishment here. Hopefully before it gets gets back to our nice you know weather that we're supposed to have. It's what we pay all these tax money for. Um, but anyway, onto the good stuff. All right, so oh, my button there is not working. My, what Steve was just talking about brought up a, a an interesting little idea here that I'm just going to go over real quick here before we get into Holly. Take some of your favorite windows, whether they be alert windows, top list windows, whatever. All right. What I did is I just drug my one of my favorite windows over here, which is my volume radar top list, and make a couple of uh, duplicate your favorite windows based on what we've been discussing on the IWM. Because once again, to use a Steve phrase, chance favors the prepared mind. So if the IWM I stole that from Art Cashin, I'm sorry, I can't take credit for it. <laughs> now, where did Art Cashin steal it from, right? I don't know. He's pretty worldly. He yeah, may yeah, have come yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody else. I'm, I'm sure it goes back a thousand years. Um, but anyway, so take one of your favorite windows. You know, you might want to pay attention to the the stock pricing because we're going to be dealing with small caps or the smaller cap stocks in the IWM. Take your volume down a little bit and just cruise over to the symbol list tab. And when we click on add existing list, we can click on the Russell 2000. It's one of our lists that we maintain. And then we can just check that bad boy and make sure it's on only the following list. That way, tomorrow, I've got a custom top list. What a great idea. The Russell 2000s, yeah. And so here you have it. You know, uh, Go ahead and get those things set up so that when – if that day comes, whether it be tomorrow or whether it's Thursday or not until next week, you're just like, hey, all right, well, I'm going to pay more attention to these windows today. And, of course, we've got all of our handy metrics for volume, where it is in its range, all kinds of good stuff. So I just wanted to, to bring that topic up. So keep that in the back of your mind here. And now let's get on to what went on in the markets today. As Steve already pointed out, kind of blackluster. We got the little gap that kind of puts the pause button on things like Holly and just makes the market a little bit more tricky on a daily basis. The bigger the gap, the trickier uh, it typically gets. But we can see Holly today, pretty light day, mixed bag of only five trades today. And just like Steve said earlier, didn't get active until about two hours in. We can see the first trade here 
8.35 Pacific Standard Time. Market opens at 6.30, so about two hours and five minutes into the session before she issued trade one. And interestingly enough here, what we were seeing was what we thought was going to be a directional bias, short, 45 minutes later, short, and then two minutes later, another short. So we had three short trades today out of a total of five trades. Show First them where thing. that looked like on the spiders, what, that, what, what the market was looking like at that moment. Because oh, yeah. I've often said when you guys see a bunch of trades pop into the window and they're all in the same direction, pay attention to what the direction of the market is. Exactly. That's where it happened right there is that second low. So 835 mm -hmm. right yep. here. It was right here when Holly started firing off some short plays, right? And the market. And then we, and then we did take another little dribble on down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah. but then of course, <clears throat> what are the expectations when we're down here and we're just butting up to not even quite the low of the prior day? Oh, you know? by the friggin' dip. Mm -hmm. So unless we were doing this on simply massive volume, which, of course, looking at my little indice uh, watcher all day, index watcher all day, SPY never was rocking even a one. You know, we closed the day at a 0.8, so slightly below normal SPY volume. And then, of course, you know, uh, just other observations when we were taking that little wick down here I mean pay attention to what goes on as these levels are being encroached upon because that right there is a pretty good tell you know once we are snuggling up here well that might be it for the day especially if the volume is not there all right so we can see here from Holly's strategy panel she came pretty stacked today not the most strategies I've ever seen her with but not the fewest either um, and we can see most of those strategies did not fire anything we only had these two two shorts and one long float on kicked off two longs all right but for a while they're approaching that level it looked like you know we we're gonna get some interesting action here and I gotta say you know to see Holly spit out more shorts than longs is not the norm as of late but it happened today and whether it was sh these two shorts right here which we're about to take a look at let's just go ahead and take a look at NVCR today and 35 cents is what it ended up with risk on if you held it and of course Holly got a little anxious with this one why did she get out profit save and of course we can see she booked a profit of zero she flatted it we can see the entry candle right here it says to get short here and of course looks very similar to a lot of trades we see except usually they're long right um, we're used to seeing the inverted fashion but of course this is a short so we get short right here at the blue line and of course what do we see happen was it it's not one that just goes immediately but what does it do it comes back and forth through that entry line several more times over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, and then starts to head lower. Now, of course, the little shaded area right here is where Holly participated and got out for a flat here. So this is a good example of a risk on trade. Keeping in mind, let me just make my chart a little bigger here, put it on a smaller time frame because right now we couldn't even see the stop. Okay. Now we can see the stop in there as long as I don't squish it up too much. So once again, we get some movement, never even acts like it's going to stop us out here. And of course, in the money for a little bit, back up to the entry line, and then the final release did give us a little bit of follow through here. So from a risk on perspective, <clears throat> if you're in the process or in the habit of doing the half with Holly, half without Holly, then you still could have gleaned some nice profit out of this trade today. A lot of room between zero and 35 cents, maybe ended up taking 15, 20 cents or scaled out of some down here. But if you're still a little bit confused on risk off and risk on, the easiest way is to do a little bit of both. I like uh, I like the entry on both of the shorts you're going to talk about. This one in particular, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. next one in particular, but this one just as much. Look at how it was not shorting lows from yesterday, trying to follow through. It's mm -hmm. selling the rip. You guys have heard buy the dip ad nauseum mm -hmm. for year after year. Well, eventually that changes to the axiom called sell the rip. And what we're starting to see here is a couple of trades that Holly, and this is number two right here, 
jumping in and selling the rip. I can't emphasize how hard it is to tell people um, like myself and Jamie who've been through a couple of bear markets after buy the dip works ad nauseum. At some point, buy the dip stops working. And the sooner you can turn your brain upside down and do what was conditioning you before to make money, to flip it upside down and start selling the rip, the better. And that's why I really think Holly in the future is going to start to create even more value for people, showing them ideas that their brain might not otherwise come up with on a stock chart like this, because this is just you know, not really what the market's been producing lately, selling the rips. But all of a sudden, we're starting to see a few of them pop up here and there, and I am finding that interesting. So imprint on that entry there. That's how you want to enter shorts, not chasing them down through yesterday's lows. Right, and these are both two good examples of the types because, once again, just popping back over to NVCR, does not go immediately. It goes sideways, then finally releases, whereas this one, boom, I mean, off to the races not much pain. All right. Mm -hmm. What we call a very painless trade. Um, so perfect entry on this little guy right here. Didn't take too long for that thing to work out. Of course, Holly gets out down here on the shaded area. Just happens to be exactly where this little guy flattened out. And of course, if we were trying to temper our expectations on this trade, we could always consult the previous days, right? So, you know, once we get down here, it's perfectly lining up here. Unless the volume was simply massive, then there's probably not a very good chance it's going to get through that level. But the initial move paid the bills on this trade right here. So 28 cents, and that's exactly what risk on ended up with uh, had you held the thing till close. Hmm. Then we had another little short that was just uh, pretty much didn't do anything. Right, short entry here, pretty much flat for the great remaining. example of reduced risk exit mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. Yep, it wasn't doing anything. And then, of course, we did have a couple of long trades, one of which worked quite uh, quite nicely. RGC for the short, change up the last initial RGR for the long here, get a nice little entry signal right here. Um, what I like about this one, even though it wasn't a huge mover, I like the setup based on a couple of different reasons. Now, predominantly, RGR was produced by Holly. Float on. Float on came to the party with statistical probability of 59.4%. So right off the bat, we've got decent statistical probability on our side. Of course, Holly calls it out. What do we do? We double click. Check this chart out. What do I notice? Well, Holly's calling it right here. The stat prob is there. Now I'm looking over here. What am I seeing? Hmm. Just happens to be coinciding with a range break, which is a pattern that I prefer, right? It's a very popular pattern. Of course, knowing which ones are going to continue, a little bit different of a story, a little bit trickier there because these are like the rabbits of the forest. They're out there all the time. They're probably the most plentiful pattern out there. Knowing which ones have the higher probability of continuing, well, that's another uh, that's another topic altogether. So we rely on the statistical probability, and then once we start coupling that with, hey, by the way, I've got this almost 60% statistical probability coupled with my favorite pattern. Now it's got two gold stars, right? So makes it easier for me or any other trader once they get used to seeing that to go, hmm on a day like today especially. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a little piece of this one because we've got two, cert, two things here that you know, could uh, produce a, uh, a winning trade, statistical probability and the pattern recognition from the human perspective. And of course, this one just boom, 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 doesn't dawdle, uh, get a nice little tick up here. Holly takes her 30 cents. If we stayed in it all day, we'd only be up 17 cents. And then of course, to see the added little cherry here, just to know how much potential was in that trade, we can see from the max profit column, Holly only missed the top by about five cents there. Max you could have got out of that thing was 35. Holly takes 30. Not bad. Uh, Clarence, hopefully that made sense to you. Uh, Clarence asks, and if anybody else wanted to know, how do you zoom in yes. and zoom out on our trade ideas charts? Mm -hmm. Hold down your control key and use the mouse wheel to spin in and out. As long as you're holding yep. the control key, you'll be able to do just like Jamie's doing there. Mm -hmm. So that's the magic. 
So when we, uh, we we don't hold the control key down, we just scroll over time, right? When we hold control down, we compress the time, right? Yeah. Yep. So just like that, if you have a mouse without a mouse wheel, the arrow keys, left and, left right, and right arrow keys, do the same thing for you. Good clarification there. Yeah. All right. Hopefully that worked for you, Clarence. Cool. Awesome. All right. And the last trade here um, was a small loser on the long side, Noah. Holly calls it right here, pretty much kind of at the top of that range, doesn't waste too much time. We can see reduced risk. She kicks it in, goes ahead and eats her six cent loser. Worked out for the better. Had we stayed in that trade, would have gave away another nine cents. Yeah, paying attention to reduced risk and, of course, stop hit are two things you want to really give Holly a little mm. bit of extra attention to, especially the stop hit. There's a reason for that stop being there. And there's usually a reason for reduced risk um, keeping us from going down and hitting that stop. So those two exit reasons uh, are the most critical ones for risk management, in, in my opinion, looking at the AI. Yes, indeed. And typically, you know, we don't go over all of Holly's trades, but here we are. We've we've gone over all of them because there was only five. And that brings me back around to another good observation. All right. So I'm sure many of you have heard me talk about the compare count windows that I like to monitor. So let's just take a look at what those guys were telling me after the first 15 minutes of the market today and then tie it into everything else. So the interesting thing here today is that after the first 15 minutes on the stocks capped over 4 billion and 5.4 billion, we had 55% uh, buying bias. And let's see here, what do you have? 55, 55. Yeah, it was pretty much 55, 55 on both the big guys, which is it never knocks my socks off. It just barely gets to the 55 level, which, you know, is kind of the first crucial level there. You know, under 55, eh, so-so bias. Above 55, better. Encroaching up to 60 and higher. That's when we know that the, the turbo is really in effect. Lots of buying going on. But today, just the 55 didn't really get my, you know, didn't get, get me too excited, especially when I'm seeing this on, you know, on the lower, uh, smaller cap stocks, a selling bias, right? So we had kind of inverse, Currents here, slight buying bias here, heavier selling bias over here. What does that tell me? Well, there was a lot of uncertainty into the mix, especially when you bring a gap into the equation on the overall markets. Um, these are all the wild cards, right? The gaps are wild cards. It makes uh, the systematic poly stuff a little bit more difficult because things aren't as exact um, with the gap up. And then, of course, it, it always brings another layer of complexity into the equation as a whole. So when I'm seeing inverse metrics like this on the small caps and the big caps without a huge bias one way or the other, it tells me, well, I just don't know, right? And sometimes that's the way the expectations should be. Well, nothing's really hammering home. Nothing's really off the charts. So what should you do in that type of environment? And that is just be real cool, calm and collective and only take the cherry trades. And then Holly reiterated that to us by not producing a trade in the first two hours, right? So that's the big takeaway here is that when things are uncertain, or uncertain, it's better to just sit on the sidelines until you see that really low risk trade with the volume or the AI produced trade, all right? Because really, in my opinion here lately, the three most powerful things that we can rely on are statistics, price action, and volume, right? And we know that Holly brings that statistical viability to the party each and every day. And the more time we spend with her, the more use, you know, used to that uh, statistical probability that we get and know how to use it. But on a day like today, where even the AI was having a hard time finding anything worth trading, then we really have to pull in our reins, keep our powder dry, so to speak, and you know try to pick the most cherry patterns that we can. And of course, you hear myself and Steve talk about this all the time. And you know we learned uh, 
a lot about these two prime factors from our buddy Brian Shannon, who is a big believer in price action, right? He's like, yep. that's, that's the only thing that pays, all right? right? And of course, price action is the king, and then right under underneath there is volume, right? Because volume in and of itself will not guarantee success or movement one way or the other. We have to have that technical pattern coupled with that volume. So I did have a couple of good long trades today um, that were brought to my attention by my good friend here, Turbo Up Family, which I'm sure many of you have on your desktop. And if you don't have it, I'll drop it in the chat when we're done here um, so you can start watching it. But basically, guys, this guy is spitting out stocks that are hitting highs with accelerated one minute volume. Typically, they're going to have high relative volume. And the added little caveat here is that position and lifetime range is going to be in excess of 100, which means no resistance typically on the stocks that are coming through here. If we just pull up one good example today, this triple G, well, we're looking at the daily here, all right? Looks like what the IWM might be trying to do. If the IWM does this, boom, it's off to the races. That's what, what we were talking about earlier, giving the troops a warm shower and a warm meal, let, letting them gather some strength for the next uh, push. Yeah, so we can see GGG did just that today. Of course, on Friday it flirted um, with that, with breaking out of that range and, and, and kind of doji right there and closed beneath, but not today. Opened up, pushed through, did it with volume, heading higher, right? Now, of course, that wasn't one of the ones I really found today, but in a timely fashion, going back to the range breaks, was able to pull out a couple of good ones today. Um, one was JP, and let me find that time I got the signal on that guy. All right, so JP, I'm looking at 15. Let me just get it back to fives here. Okay, so what I did of course, I pulled out the windows individually. I'm searching the history here, and this was for the Turbo Breaks Up version. And we can see today, right here at the 7:10 time zone, or excuse me, time, which will be 10:10, 10:11 in Eastern time. Double click here, arrows right here, because I got that alert at this time. Hey, JP's hitting you high. It's doing crazy volume. So Jamie just pulls it up, just like he cycles through 30, 40 symbols every morning from this ticker here. The reason we're using new high is because if a stock is truly breaking out of its range that's been established since the open, it cannot do that without hitting a new high. So you know the goal here is to catch them just as they're breaking that plane and verifying that the volume is there, and then of course assessing our risk. So on this one, the entry bar is here. How do I assess my risk? Well, everybody's a little bit different, but this is the way I do it. And keep in mind, you know, it's because I'm using five minute intraday candles here. Entry bar here, obviously we don't want to chase it. We want to get it as close to this level as we can. But let's say, you know, even halfway up that bar would have, get, would have been a good entry. And then to assess my risk, I don't use the entry bar. I look back 15 minutes. 5, 10, 15, if that's an acceptable risk, which this was because we had those nice, cute type five minute candles right there making a nice little base for me. So the bottom of the prior 15 minute period, right outside this line here, touching with those wicks, nice tight stop in case we're wrong. But in this case, we can see, no, we were not wrong. We were very right, off to the races. Now, at the same time, I'm sizing this up and assessing my risk and making the entry and getting all that stuff done. Obviously, it wouldn't have been coming through here if the one-minute volume was not already high, but I can easily verify from my single stock window at that time, these one-minute volume levels and a five-minute volume level was off the hook. We pile on a very healthy relative volume number on top of that, and, you know, simple great way to tell if the volume is still there and how it's been and how it could potentially finish up on the day. So 1.8 million shares is how JP finished the day. When on a three month average, it only trades not quite 350,000 shares. Volume has been heating up. Obviously that's why we're seeing the smaller time frames increase. 
But coming into the session, only a five-day running average of uh, not quite a million shares, and it cracked off almost two million shares today. So one of the stocks that just didn't care just kept going up all day, all day, all day on heavy volume. Of course, it's going to take its pullbacks, which can be excellent buying opportunities as well. And of course, this pattern here can repeat itself just as it did right here. And that's the good thing about identifying these buyers early is they'll go through their ebbs and flows, becomes range bound again here, pops that range again. And if we did decide to make a second entry here, use this candle or this candle as the entry, looking back 15 minutes, it would have thrown a little curveball, but it would not have gotten us out on a second entry there. All right. And then, of course, depending on how aggressive you are, Sometimes you can even get more. Of course, we had a nice little push into the open here and a repeat of the pattern. So clearly, in my opinion, the institutions were jumping in and, and acquiring this, uh, this stock today, you know, on a day where, yeah, there were some stocks going up, there were some stocks going down, but as far as continued uh, up movement, sure, we had things like Baidu, <clears throat> I think, going up all day, a little bit pricier of a stock. Um, but I do distinctly recall Baidu coming through this window as well. So if you do like to trade the, the bigger price stocks, perfect opportunity in Baidu as well today. Now, of course, there was also another good you know, mid-range stock as well, which was found using the exact same technique. Let me just get down here and find it again. Which was this guy right here, ESNT which pretty much motored up all day too, rounded out the day with a 2.79 on relative volume and 1.5 million shares. Of course, this one was a bigger cap stock, whereas the uh, the JP, let's see, let's just go back to JP real quick. We can see here, yeah, just under 4 billion, right? And of course, ESET, slightly over 4 billion. So, you know, Still a larger cap stock on the JP as well, just not quite 4 billion. But here we can see once again, the same type of pattern here. Not quite as pretty as the other one, but a range nonetheless. Put in a slow here and the high, <clears throat> goes range bound, sneaks back up, cracks that level right there, and then hugs a little bit, doesn't do much passing back and forth, but then finally catches. And once again, if we use the entry bar here, 5, 10, 15, we got a nice risk area. Risk area here, all the way up to here, is the reward area. So nice risk reward on identifying some of the heavy volume movers early on using the simple range break. And of course, I like to play by the rules, so I'm marking that wick as the high of course some people that get sick of all those opening wicks tend to go with the candle bodies that's just a personal preference but you can see same old song and dance you just got a little bit better of an entry um, depending on whether or not you included the wick there so two really good movers two really good continued movers from jp and esnt all being pointed out to you by the turbo up family today now, what I'd like to point out about these charts, <clears throat> go back to JP, whether we look at JP or ESNT, I showed you the methodology here about how to find these things. So what are we relying on to find these, these range breaks? We're relying on two things, price action and volume, right? Because notice what's not on the chart. No moving averages, no Fibonacci's, no Bollinger Bands, no itchy, scratchy clouds, right? Now, if we did put those things on top, we'd notice some correlations. That's all they would be. So these patterns here are found using price action and volume. So keep that in mind. Simple is better, right? Keep it simple, silly. And there's lots of other versions uh, of that little saying. But I think you get the idea here let's 
demystify things. Let's make things as less complicated as possible. So if you can really rely on price action and volume on some of these very simple patterns, then what what better way is there? Then we have Holly. We got price action, we got volume, we got statistical probability on our side. And then using those things in unison yields an even more powerful beast. So that's pretty much it for today on, on the movers that I found, the ones that were you know relatively easy to identify, kept moving, had a little bit from Holly, had a little bit from price action volume, and on a day like today, that's about the best that you can hope for. All right, I'm just taking a taking a glance at the questions here. Looks like Steve uh, <sighs> keeping them caught up here. Trying to go. It would be much simpler with bar charts rather than silly candles. Ah, I disagree, Bill. Candles aren't yeah, silly. I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna have to say that as well. Yeah. It's a personal preference. You know, you got your overhead, high, low, close. Some people like those. A lot of people like candles. It's just a preference. Now, of course, having said that, you know, if we right click and use the old send to, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do have these alternative charting sources that if our charts are giving you exactly, you know, what you, the way you might want to see it, you can always spawn one of these windows and then have, you know, maybe some of the uh, different price charts. That's just an option there for you, Bill. Um, if you don't like looking at the candles. Around. Yeah. Yeah, for some reason, we just all got exposed to candlesticks back in the day, and that's what we stuck with. And, of course. I, I started with high-low close, and once I saw the, the candles, I gravitated to candles. So, yeah, it's, yeah uh, I, I don't know why I like the candles better. They're just a little bit more soothing uh, to me than the uh, – well, I, like seeing, I like seeing rejection wicks a lot cleaner and things like that as right, well. Right, right, right. Okay, right. so um, as far as Holly goes and as far as finding some good movers that had continuations today, um, covered that. So let's just do a little time check here. And there was one other thing that I was going to bring up here. You were going to drop some cloud links. I know that. Yeah, let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and take the opportunity to drop this cloud link in here for the uh, Turbo family up. No resistance. All right, so that guy's in there. All right, yeah, we already went over the little drill here about how to take your favorite windows, simply duplicate them, and then go ahead and point some of those guys to the Russell 2000, just in case that thing decides it wants to get frisky and take off, or who knows, maybe it gets all tired and crusty and wants to fold over, which, you know, would bring up a few good short opportunities. Um, but with the extra time that we have here, I think we can open up the floor to a couple of charts. Steve, what do you think? Sure. Let's just do uh, two or three and see what we can find. All right. I'm letting you know, Bill, you can send an email to info at trade-ideas.com. I don't think I spelled it correctly. Let me spell it correctly. Um, and just call it a feature request and say, you know, is it possible for the people who don't want to look at candlesticks, is there a high-low open-close option? And if there is an option, um, they'll put it in their stack of priorities, and maybe they'll be able to come up with that at some point. Right, and we're going to talk about PCG in just a second, David. I just want to answer Frank's question real quickly yeah. here. Mm -hmm. He was asking, please explain the color coding on the Turbo Up family. And as you can see here, it's spitting out the last three things that each strategy spit out. So we've got green, blue, and yellow. So what does that mean? These are basically market caps. So the green is going to be anything with a market cap over 5.4 billion. The blue is going to well actually I think that's over 4 billion. Let's just let's just confirm here. Right, okay. So green is 4 billion market cap and higher. Blue is going to be the stocks hitting the highs that are capped between 2 and 4 billion. So there might be a little bit of overrun, but I think I put the 999. Let's just take a look here. Yeah, okay. So there shouldn't be any overrun because I did the 3,999,000,000 there. 
and then of course the yellow ones are going to be the companies capped under 2 billion or in this case 1 billion 999 million blah 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 so that's what the color coding is for the turbo family no resistance okay now let's take a look at pcg um david was that's an interesting one the airplane jane tweeted this one out today on the daily chart is wow. what you got to look at. Yeah. wow and of course this is um look steve this is our that's not pg and e uh that's pg and e yeah it's the uh so that's the people that provide our utility yeah specific gas and electric mm -hmm. those are the people that that charge me triple <laughs> what the rest of the nation gets their electricity for yes okay and this is well the theory is that because of all the fires right um their business model is going to be impacted is that what it is on that particular I believe, play i believe i heard something about it but regardless of what the real reason is when we're looking at the footprints in the sand here you know we, we just blew right through this level and this level so if it you know if they're more well we wit we actually wit down there so maybe maybe the energy has been expended maybe not i mean that's that's just kind of a wild card right there you know yeah that's what's going on it's uh, the california fires i just did a quick twitter search which by the way is really easy to do you guys you just put the dollar sign in front of the symbol and search twitter and you'll see what people are talking about and you quickly see that they're talking about the california wildfires and things like that so that's the catalyst but what is the footprints in the sand showing us well uh, first day solid selling second day a lot of solid selling but a lift off the lows mm -hmm. today third day of selling way off the lows a nice mm -hmm. big long tail so i did try to go backwards in time and look left and see if there was you know some reasoning down there i'm going to just go ahead and go out on the line and say that the level eyeballing 50 cents give or take is about 54.79 or maybe even 55 because i'm going all the way back in time to uh, November 2015, um, there was a lot of uh, resistance. And then I'm going back to February 2016, there was a lot of support. So resistance that becomes support is basically a pivot line. And so we're very close to that pivot line. Um, we're not back above it yet. So I would kind of like to see a trade back above you know, 54.79. Now, what you could do in a situation like this is just get it on the radar, maybe put 20 or 25 percent of your full load um, anywhere on the open tomorrow and then just monitor the trade. And if it goes against you, well, it's a very small position to start with. But getting a starter uh, position or something on the radar to give you a skin in the game will help you really focus greatly. And you could consider adding to it, in my opinion, if it trades back above 55. Uh, with any vigor it might be ready for some sort of a, a bounce back but you know it's obviously falling off a cliff for a reason it's just a matter of how long do you want to trust a dead cat bounce like that yeah and you know as one of the users was just commenting um you know maybe it was their lines that started the fire i mean i, I i've heard that through a few news stories um Interesting. but of course you know they're publicly traded utility and well you know as well as I do, Steve, uh, sometimes they don't have to take responsibility like you or I would do if we started the fire. <laughs> no, <there's laughs> so, a two-tiered uh, system. It, you know, yeah, it, it, it's a if slippery slope. If you're the CEO slope. of Equ Equifax mm -hmm. and you've data breached uh, three months knowingly yeah, and kept okay. it under your okay. pillow, and then uh, you leave with uh, $18 million in payments, that's cool. Yeah, 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 whatever. Um, let's see here. Catherine was saying she don't know, she does not know how to delete um, a markup. Well, let me show you, Catherine. Here, we just click on that guy, and then we hit our delete key. All right. So anytime you want to get rid of a line, you just click on it, hit the delete key, and it should disappear. Just a uh, caveat or a follow-up on that. If Catherine, if you have an older version, you may have to turn off crosshairs first before you do that. The newer versions allow us to have the crosshairs on and highlight, select, delete, move, but the older versions, if, if that's not working for you, 
the next step would be turn off your crosshairs and then that step should work for you. Okay, so guys, we're gonna, t we're gonna take two more questions here. I'm gonna uh, answer in a little bit more detail Sam's question about volume and then we'll go to Kirk uh, for some pre-market stuff and I think that'll be just about it. But Sam, to address your question on volume, you were asking when you say good volume, you know, well, what does that mean? Hundreds of thousands, millions? Well, it's all kind of based on relativity or what's relative to the stock, right? So when I was showcasing JP earlier, well, the whole time that JP was coming across my radar, the family, the Turbo Up family that I just dropped into the chat window, it has to have three times normal one minute volume coursing through that stock as the highest hit, otherwise it won't show up, right? So I know the one minute volume is strong when it comes through here. Then I confirm is five minute and relative volume matching up, right? So, you know, here's a stock that usually only trades 350,000 shares in a normal session for that stock. I would probably have no interest in trading that stock typically. But today was not a typical day for JP. So you see what we're doing is we're finding the things that really have special volume in them compared to what is normal to them. Because you can't just go using blankets of a million shares a day because a stock that trades a million a day, if it's only gonna trade a million a day, that's nothing special, right? It makes pattern completion and follow through on any type of continuation pattern. Uh, a lot more less likely. I'd say for Kirk's question, basically just go to the pre-market channel um, and there's gonna be a lot of interesting ideas there. And mm -hmm. for your second mm -hmm. question, Kirk, I'm gonna type to you on that one. So go ahead and just talk about that channel. Right, so pre-market channel, you know, what are we looking for in pre-market? Well, we're looking for things that are active in the pre-market. Now that could mean things that are gapping up from the prior close in the pre-market that necessarily or might not necessarily be trading a whole lot. Maybe they're trading a little bit, but that's one of the first places people look. What's gapping up, what's gapping down from the prior close. And then of course, we have pre-market movers, which are, uh, this little window here is actually going to show me not only stocks, you know, we've got the gappers over here, but then these are the things that are actually trading and doing volume before the open. Maybe they gapped up, maybe they didn't. Maybe they've got a gap up and they're trading. But as far as finding anything that's actually trading pre-market, this is your best bet right here. Go to the pre-market channel, pre-market movers, things that are gapping up and down, and that's gonna get you a nice bead uh, for the day on you know what's moving around pre-market. Did you uh, maybe want, I don't know, I was typing, but did you want to show them how they can steal one of those alerts? Oh, yeah. Take yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is really the way to do it, guys, right here. <clears throat> right, because you've got your default layout that you want to start, you know, carving out or dialing in. Um, in other words, the software, you want it to come back up with all your windows intact, just right, right where you left them, with all the settings intact. But let's say you don't have these windows in your default layout and you came over here to the channel, well, you can snag any of these windows by simply right-clicking and saying, save or share to cloud, click save, right? That way, when I come back to my default layout like so, then to add that window that I just archived, what I would do is file. I like to use the word stole. Yeah. The window that you just stole load and then I can see there's that pre-market movers sitting right at the top of my list. Highlight it, hit load. Now this guy can work be, you know, he can we can find a home for him, put him wherever we want, save our default layout. That way he pops back up every time and we've incorporated this window into our default layout, which we have stolen from the pre-market mm -hmm. channel. So they you can steal deal. any you can steal any window from any channel just by right clicking in there and saving it to your cloud. Exactly. All right, good stuff. All right, very good. We got a couple of minutes. So uh, Scott, if you're waiting in the wings, uh, we're ready for you, buddy. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, so let's remind everyone about a few things. Um, we have... Okay.
What which slide is first off of that? Oh, we're on broker. Well, you want to talk about B plus or? Oh, well, sure. Yeah, Tell broker me. plus. If you're an interactive brokerage client, uh, it's still in beta, so you can use it for free as long as you have an active trade idea subscription. You have to have a premium subscription, which, by the way, you can try during the test drive that's coming up. Um, so if you're on interactive brokerage, go ahead and uh, do some investigating to see if you're interested in doing uh, using brokerage plus it can automate your trades you can manage your portfolio all directly from trade ideas through IB uh, it's I think available actually in the standard release now but it's technically a beta portion of that so uh, you know uh, find out if you're interested in that if you have any questions just contact us through the normal uh, support channels and uh, we'll fill you in about that uh, we also have a podcast uh, comes out every Friday. The last one was pretty good. You should check it out. Just uh, search for Trade Ideas Podcast in the podcast app that you use and add us to your subscription and then download some of the recent episodes and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Um, more importantly, though, you have an ability for you to try all the premium features for five full days and you can sign up through the 25th and uh, the actual official start day is the 23rd. We recommend getting in on it before it actually starts. That way you can come to all the special training sessions that we're going to have during that week and special webinars. Uh, just go to tradeideas.com slash test drive and sign up for that. It costs $8. That covers your exchange fees for all the real-time data and the extra support we need to take care of that week. These are always uh, very popular. And if you're a standard subscriber, it also gives you a chance to try premium. So if you're standard and you're uncertain about upgrading to premium, you know, Sign up for this for $8 and uh, try all the advanced features that we have for our premium clients, and you'll see if you want to do the upgrade. It's one of the best ways to give it a shot. Uh, also, if you're ready to become a subscriber today, just go to tradeideas.com slash price and use the code. The code's good this month. It's FinTech, but you have to use it all caps like you have it on the screen, and that's good for either standard or premium for 15% off your first installment. It includes, even if it, even the discounted uh, standard or premium monthlies or annuals includes the full hour of one-on-one -on -one training with like Steve or Jamie or Andy. So when you become a subscriber, that's a great way to really get onboarded into using trade ideas the right way for you after you uh, check things out and go to the training room and all that kind of stuff. Uh, sign up for the free training. Uh, any questions, just email us, info at trade-ideas.com. But if you're not yet a premium subscriber, go to trade-ideas.com slash test drive and get into that. Um, you'll actually have access as early as this Friday after the close, about 4.30 p.m. Eastern. So you can actually have it for more than five days if you sign up before Friday because you can pregame all weekend long. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Steve. We'll have the recording up later on. Oh, in any case, I think we're – Pretty much, you still there, Scott? Yeah. Okay, you dropped out for a second there. Okay, well, I don't know where that happened. I was just saying, uh, if you have any questions, email us, info at trade-ideas.com. Uh, thanks, Jamie and Steve. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for popping in, and come back and check out Steve tomorrow in the Trade of the Week. All right.